Monday, October 22nd, 2018, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. This morning, I want to talk about how we're pawns uh, in a big uh, new world order or globalist game. And we have been, our grandfathers, great grandparents have been uh, for hundreds of years uh, that, uh, in my opinion, things do not happen by accident, and these uh, the people in charge uh, have a very strong grip on human events, uh, economic events, and I'm going to use three books to try to prove to you my, my theory and my, my belief. Uh, one of them is called uh, The Energy Non-Crisis by Lindsay Williams. Uh, the other one is called The Tower of Basel by Adam Liebor, and uh, finally, uh, but not least, uh, Pawns in the Game by William Guy Carr. And uh, before that, of course, I'll uh, have a look at uh, the markets and see what, where, we do, where we are this morning. It's uh, 8.16 a.m. in London, so uh, we've got uh, Spot Gold. 1227 so up about slightly half a half a dollar uh, or 50 cents the range has been 1225.50 to 1230.50 so still holding up we closed around 1227 uh, or 1226.50 on Friday Uh, silver is up three cents at 1466 Range has been 1459 to 1469. Um, so still a very narrow range. Technically, I think silver needs to break above 15 to confirm a new leg higher. We're still not there. Uh, the Dow up 84 this morning or a third of a percent, 25,528. Um, still think we're forming that flag consolidation before the next drop as you can see here on this chart. Uh, the S&P is up eight uh, at uh, 27.75, up uh, just over a quarter of a percent. The NASDAQ 100 future is up 30 or 0.4 of a percent at 71.35. So what about the uh, currency markets? Uh, the pound is up uh, 14 and a half ticks, so marginally, uh, or pips, marginally higher at 130.82. Euro is up uh, a quarter of a percent at 115.45. The dollar uh, is up 0.17 of a percent against the yen at 112.71. The dollar uh, is unchanged against the yuan. The Chinese currency is at 693.29. Crude oil is firmer all around. Uh, WTI is at uh, 69.80 up uh, 50 cents or 0.7 of a percent. Uh, Brent crude is just below 80. It's at 79.91, up half a percent. Uh, What about Italy? We had the downgrade on on Friday. Uh, I said it would be interesting to see what we were doing this morning. Uh, And actually, uh, it's continued to go lower the Italian yield. Uh, It's down another 14 basis points, 335. I read something on the mainstream media, uh, Bloomberg, I think someone said that uh, the fact that uh, Moody's didn't downgrade Italy to junk was a positive. Uh, So that's how the market is seeing that maybe, but uh, I personally think that the closer it is to junk, the worse it is, but uh, uh, we'll have to see. Italy is not out of the woods yet, Uh, still highly elevated uh, uh, levels uh, on its yield. Um, I guess the BTP bun spread has come off quite a bit. So for now, Italy is calm again, but uh, things can change very quickly. Uh, U.S. 10-year yield right now is at uh, 320 or up uh, one basis points. So just to remind people when the yields are higher in bonds, that's not a good thing. That means the prices are going down. That means the cost of financing for the governments um, are going up. Uh, If you're talking about treasuries, of course, but that impacts all other bond markets as well. 
If you think the Monaco 64 channel adds value to you and you'd like to contribute or help the channel, check the links uh, below in the description. Pawns in the game. Uh, and why am I talking about that? Well, because I think people need to be more, um, how can I say, not waste so much their energy on all the uh, distractions that we get uh, in the media, especially the mainstream media, but also in the alternative, alternative media of left versus right, uh, the Hegelian dialectic uh, of keeping not only the uh, people uh, domestically divided, <clears throat> excuse me, but international internationally divided. And I see a lot of that, you know, it hasn't changed even with a new administration with President Trump, who's supposed to change things. Uh, I think the Hegelian dialectic is getting worse. Uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, current administration is very belligerent. Uh, it's divided the United States even more. It's divided the United States uh, also against foreign nations even more. And I think it's uh, par for the course uh, because that's uh, where they want to keep us. They, was, they want to keep us uh, scared, um, divided. Uh, and that's why I'm doing this video about uh, why we're pawns in the game uh, and why you need to like get out of that paradigm or that mindset. Uh, why why uh, have I been like this? Why, why, what's made me, you know, shape, shape me into thinking like that? Well, initially, I guess as a child, uh, my father, uh, my parents, um, they were kind of uh, the same way. Uh, they didn't care much for politics. They cared more about taking care of uh, our family. And I think that's what people need to focus on. Uh, of course, you need to know what's going on so you can try to uh, protect yourself. And there are some books that prove that point. And uh, I, I, had no, I hadn't read this, these books when I was younger, uh, when uh, you know my mind was molded by my parents, especially my father, uh, about these things. You know, trying to be your own person and be self-sufficient and try not de to depend on government for anything, because. Uh, usually, not usually, but 100% of the time, what governments want is to uh, get more and more money from you, uh, to uh, inflate more and more your currency, to uh, divide you, to scare you, so they can stay in power. This is an old saying that uh, war is the health of the state, right? And that hasn't changed. So let's start out with the energy non-crisis and all these books you can find them on Amazon and I'll put links below in the description if you do want to get these books the energy non-crisis book is a it's out of print uh, so it is a bit more expensive I think it's around 40 pounds 43 pounds which is just over $50 uh, so this book was written by uh, Lindsay Williams uh, in the early 80s energy non-crisis uh, and I read this a few years ago and I started reading it again over the week this past weekend and uh, it's always good to reread some books because you know uh, a lot of times current events uh, you can connect them better to when you read the book you know f five years ago when I read this book things were different so it's always good to uh, refresh and the interesting thing that I took from this book and I'm not going to talk about the price of oil or anything like that I just want to talk about the uh, the strategy that they use and uh, how these all these crises are, are actually engineered for some kind of uh, long-term goals they have very long-term goals they uh, their goals are more uh, like 100 year goals 50 year goals uh, these people in charge, uh, they, um, they have deep pockets, they have a lot of influence, and they control uh, the money, they control governments. And again, I don't want to touch upon uh, religion, because I think people of all religions are involved in this kind of, you could call it a conspiracy, because 
there are several people, uh, sometimes unwittingly uh, aiding and abetting this, uh, this strategy. But uh, on chapter three, uh, you know, I was reading that and, and the title is Shut Down That Pipeline. And uh, it's amazing because people forget like uh, the oil embargo in 1973, uh, the oil crisis. Most people think it was just because uh, OPEC uh, cut the supply of oil uh, because of uh, the uh, Israeli situation, the war. I think it was the Arab-Israeli war in 1973, and the Saudis, uh, who were in charge of OPEC, cut the you know cut down the supply a lot to drive the price higher uh, because they were not happy about what was happening in the Middle East, and that's what we think. But <laughs> you read uh, chapter three here, uh, and Lindsey William talks about how he was in uh, Wyoming on a friend's uh, ranch in 1972. And uh, how a pipeline was running through that ranch, uh, oil pipeline, and uh, how the oil was flowing. This farmer or this rancher, he got paid for this oil to flow through his property. But then, a year later, in 1973, that pipeline was shut down. Not because the oil was gone. The rancher or farmer was ordered to shut down. Uh, the pipeline by the federal government. And I read here from page 29, uh, the rancher is telling him about uh, uh, when he had an argument with a, f with a guy from the oil company that came uh, to his ranch to shut down the pipeline and says, well, the man finally recognized that I was getting a little bit indignant and, and he said, and this is to the rancher, well, mister, if you really want to know the truth, the truth is the federal government has ordered us to close this pipeline down. The old Westerner went on and told how he stood up to the boss man. <laughs> Why man, I can hardly believe that. After all, we've got an energy crisis. The boss uh, man answered, sir, we're closing it down because we've been ordered to. So, yeah, so when they tell us it was the Saudis that started the oil crisis, uh, I don't think so. I think the Saudis, they're just pawns uh, in the game, just like us. But uh, maybe they're, they're more, uh, a little more than pawns, uh, but uh, they're not the king <laughs> in the game. So there you go. That's the uh, energy non-crisis. Um, so you can see how... Uh, and who in the federal government did that? I don't know, and they don't know. But uh, you can see that uh, if there was a crisis and people were queuing up or lining up to buy uh, gas or petrol, as the English uh, call it, why would they shut down oil coming from the west to the east through pipelines in the U.S.? It would make it even worse. So, uh, second book. Uh, second book is the Tower of Basel which is about the Bank for International Settlements. Uh, and this is the most amazing, uh, how can I say, story that shows that all these wars as well that we've had, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, uh, the War on Terror, it's all engineered by the same people. Uh, why? Well, because this BIS bank, which is a central banker's bank, was running and operating and doing business for both sides during World War II, and there's proof of that here. But chapter 5, page 59, an, auth an, an authorized plunder. And I quote here, uh, the Bank for International Settlements is the bank which sanctions the most notorious outrage of this generation, the rape of Czechoslovakia. George Strauss, Labour MP, speaking in the House of Commons, May 1939. So I'll just give you a little taster here, what, what happened uh, to the BIS, who they helped in, 19, uh, in the late 30s, uh, just around the time the war started, a little bit before. Uh, and I quote, when Nazi Germany annexed Czech, the Czechoslovak border province of the Sudetenland in September 1938, it immediately absorbed a good part of the country's banking system uh, as well, as most of Czechoslovakia's uh, strategic defenses. By then, 
the country's national bank had prudently transferred most of its gold abroad on two accounts at the Bank of England. One in, one in the name of the BIS and one in the name of the National Bank of Czechoslovakia itself. As here, the Nazis' first demand came in February 1939 when Berlin ordered Prague to transfer just over 14 and a half metric tons of gold, supposedly to back the German currency now circulating in Sudetenland. This was certainly an inno innovative idea. First invade a neighboring country, annex part of it, and then demand that the newly truncated state supply the gold to pay for the loss of its territory. So did the BIS stand up for Czechoslovakia? Well, no, they didn't, because it says here, meanwhile in Basel, Johan Bayen, the Dutch president of the BIS, wavered. Bayen discussed the matter with the BIS's legal advisor, Felix Weiser. But like Norman, Weiser took the most formalistic approach possible. As long as the paperwork was in order, the monies must go through. And who was Norman? Well, he was the president, of, uh, the governor of the Bank of England. So there you go. Uh, that was what the part of what the BIS did. And another amazing part uh, is on chapter 8. It says, an arrangement with the enemy. Uh, and it goes to show how... Uh, the United States had a banker at the BIS during World War II. He didn't represent the United States Treasury, but uh, he represented Wall Street, uh, and his name was Thomas McKittrick. So I read here, uh, the bearer of this letter, Mr. Thomas McKittrick, president of the BIS, is a close friend of a prominent member of the State Department stationed in Switzerland, Mr. Alan Dulles. And I think he worked for uh, J.P. Morgan, if I'm not mistaken. It says, Meanwhile, Thomas McKittrick had a lucrative new job. Soon after he stepped down as BIS president in 1946, he was appointed a vice president of Chase National in New York in charge of foreign loans. Uh, McKittrick was even lauded by those, uh, those whose stolen goods he had purveyed. He was invited to Brussels and decorated with the Royal Order of the Crown of Belgium. The honor noted a press release was in recognition of his friendly attitude to Belgium and his services as president of the Bank of in for International Settlements during World War II. So there you go. Uh, was that really a, a war that was going to save the world from evil? Uh, maybe partly, but... Uh, did the bankers care? No, they did really well and they worked together. So another example of how we're pawns in the game. And then, well, this is the classic one, Pawns in the Game by William Guy Carr, which I recommend as well. And he goes back to, uh, you know, before the Bank of England was formed, the English Revolution in the 1640s, uh, then the uh, French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. So they're always engineering these crises to gain more control. So William Guy Carr. So uh, the message, you know, my message of course is uh, be your own central bank as usual, be self-reliant, uh, don't uh, waste too much energy uh, fighting each other or listening to all these uh, distractions on the mainstream media, uh, focus uh, on improving uh, yourself, uh, doing the best you can for your family, and that's all we can do, but also know what the enemy is doing, and that uh, nothing happens by accident. So, if you enjoyed this video, please like, share it, subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. You can also follow me on Steemit, DTube, and on Twitter. I'll talk to you later. Take care. Bye.